Hello everyone, Simon Jacobson here and welcome to another episode of Biblical Characters Decoded. We're going to be speaking about Jacob and Esau of the Bible, the battle between good and evil. This program is dedicated by Lisa Hawkins in honor of her mother, Sarah Rosen's yard site. The best-selling book of all time is the Bible. It's such a big bestseller that it doesn't even hit any of the bestseller lists. How ironic, right? Well, there's a reason for it, because it's a book that goes back thousands of years and yet remains as timely as ever. Its stories, narratives, its characters, people find, reflect, and mirror our own lives. So what we've been doing is this series taking different biblical characters, addressing the core story and how it's relevant and meaningful in our personal lives with the different lessons, sometimes surprising ones, that it provides. So let's talk about the classic battle between the twin brothers, Jacob and Esau, famous story in the Bible, where Rebecca is carrying twins, and she has a very difficult pregnancy, and she asks God, why is it so difficult and God tells her, because you're carrying two nations within you, two nations, two archetypes, two forces, and they will be in perpetual struggle throughout their lives. And that's being reflected in your womb, the two brothers that would end up becoming Esau and Jacob. Now, both are children of Isaac and Rebekah, righteous people, the most righteous in history, and yet they were very um, antithetical to each other. Alter egos, you can say. And the story goes, they're born very, they look different, their personalities are different. And yes, they are in conflict. Their personality type, their attitudes. But I wouldn't call it just good and evil because that makes it too simple. It's actually two voices and two forces, like two nations, archetypes that are within each one of us. Because as I said, they're both children of great people. So it's hard to say that one was a cruel and wicked person, the other one was a tzaddik and a righteous one. They were two forces which can go in both directions. Jacob was known as Ishtom Yosheva Halim. He was the innocent one, the scholar, the wholesome one. He spent time studying. Esau is described as a warrior, a hunter, a person who knew, who knew the guile and all the, the, the shrewdness of hunting in this world. Now, they seem to be antithetical, of course, to each other, but when you think about it, it's actually two forces within each one of us. We both have the, vo the voice of survival, where we need to go to war, where we need to protect ourselves, where we need to defend ourselves against the elements and against the different hostile forces that exist out there. And then there's the other one inside of us, you can say the scholar, the transcendent voice that focuses on spiritual ideals, the aspirations, the dreams that each of us has. And they are in constant conflict. Who will dominate? Which voice will be the one that you follow? Is it the voice of self-interest? Is it the voice of transcendence? And just to spell it out in real specific detail, most of our lives in this material world, we are busy with surviving. What that means is eating, drinking, grooming, personal life, our pleasures, sexuality, entertainment, work, I mean, a third of our lives, almost a third at least, we're asleep. One third. If you sleep eight hours a day, or eight hours a night, that's one third of the day, of the 24-hour day. But even if you sleep less than that, if you think of it, most of the day we are focusing on existing or surviving. And then there's another voice within each of us, which is that we're not satisfied with animal bliss, with just hunting and with um, surviving but we also search for something transcendent, which means something that, that is beyond just the existence. And that is satisfied in many different ways. For some people, it's through literature, art, music, romance, love, travel. For many, it's through religion, faith, spirituality. I mean, there are many different outlets, but it's very clear that we're not satisfied just with making it. And that, in a way, you can say is the difference between the body and the soul. The body and its bodily needs, the physical needs, and the soul and its spiritual needs. Sometimes a beautiful analogy to describe these two forces is like, think of it like a flame and a wick. 
just look at a flame. So in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs he tells us that the, flame, that the soul of a human being is, the, is the, a divine flame. A flame is the closest approximation to what your soul looks like. It's constantly flickering, so it's restless. A healthy restlessness, a certain healthy angst, dreaming, aspiring, yearning, longing, which is so much the hallmark of what makes us human. But then there's the wick that grounds us. The wick is the grounding part, which is like more the bodily, the physical side of it. And they need each other, because if a person was just to satisfy their spiritual needs, they can basically expire and lose touch with uh, being, being in this world. On the other hand, to be completely consumed with materialism and our own self-interest is, is, is uh, perhaps even worse. So it's a constant struggle, it's a constant battle between flame and wick, and it's about fa- creating a balance. In the Kabbalistic and mystical tradition, the way you create the balance, and how do you relieve the tension between matter and spirit? You relieve it by spiritualizing the material. There are schools of thought that talk about asceticism, about just cutting yourself off, going to a mountain, and just getting out of the rat race and the Wall Street uh, rush, rush, and just living in a very, a very um, austere and simple life. There are others that say, no, in material life, you can find a way of thinking of the Protestant work ethic and other examples of that. But there's a third school of thought, and that is the Jewish mystical school of thought that teaches that there is, there's, a, there's an absolute ability to integrate the two. And that's based on a cr- critical principle, the principle that life is neither matter nor spirit. Those are two forces, but there's a third dimension that transcends both. In other words, a, a, le- a level that transcends transcendence. And there, it comes down to a fusion between matter and spirit, between matter and energy, where we actually spiritualize our material lives. We don't escape from it. We don't see it as a necessary evil or, a, uh, or something you, you can't avoid. You see it as an opportunity, in the words of the Kabbalists, to redeem and reveal the divine sparks, the spiritual sparks that exist within everything in this material world. So in that context, Jacob and Esau actually are twins. They both need each other, with Esau representing more the body and the physical side of it, and, and Jacob representing the soul and the spirit. And they need each other. The body is the vehicle, and the soul is the captain of the ship. And they need to speak to each other and need to integrate with each other. The problem is that they have their own interests. At, at the surface level, at least ostensibly, soul and body don't necessarily want to work with, well with each other because they have very different goals. The soul is seeking transcendence, seeking higher purpose, seeking meaning in life, and the body is seeking self, uh, self-pleasure, seeking uh, f- fulfillment of its own desires and its temptations and whatever its impulses direct us toward. Sometimes this battle can be compared to the battle between mind and heart, where the emotions, they're not bad necessarily, but emotions are impulsive. They follow what your emotions, your subjective interests. The mind, on the other hand, a healthy mind, is a reflective force. So when something comes your way, how do you determine whether it's the right thing to do or not to do? So in a healthy human being, you let your heart speak, but then you have the mind checking and seeing, one second, reality check, and reflecting, is this healthy for you? It may appear very tempting and may be very seductive, but the mind, in a sense, reflects and reviews and evaluates. And then it can say to the heart, this seems right. You meet someone, you go on a date, or any other type of interaction. So initially, you may have all kinds of different things that attract you to someone, but your mind is meant to balance that and say, one second, we have to know whether this is the right person for me, or am I just physically attracted or sexually attracted? Is there more going on? Someone calls you on a a telemarketer, calls you, and they're very good at manipulating your emotions. And they tell you, Here's the deal of the century, and you have to make a decision immediately. Why immediately? Because they know if you think about it too much, you may not do it. So they're trying to manipulate and trying to get your emotions connected to it. And that's when we make most of our mistakes in life, where we react impulsively to things. Most mistakes would be avoided if you let yourself sleep on it. You know, right now you're attracted to something, or you're repulsed by something, or repelled by something. Wait, wait, wait overnight. Wait a few hours. I mean, how many emails have I written in the moment of anger or getting upset? And then I, and then I said, you know what, before I send it, let me think about it. 
and you wake up the next morning, you read it, and you say, ah, you know, it was good that I wrote it, I vented, but it's better not to send it. Or if you make the decision, it's the right thing to do, at least you're doing it deliberately. So emotions are critical in life because that's where, really where life plays itself out. You have to have a ship, but you need a captain of the ship. You can't just allow the impulses in every given situation to control the situation. Because, now, at times when there's an emergency, obviously you have to follow your impulse, immediate impulse, because there's no time to waste. But a healthy person is someone that the mind is very much part of the... Even in an emergency, you also want to have your head about you and not just react because you can also create more problems than solve. So the key thing is to have balance. And in many ways, Jacob and Ephraim rep- represent these two. Now, let's make it clear. This doesn't mean each of them exclusively is a body and soul. They both, of course, have both dimensions. But the focus in each one of them is one or the other. Now, here's the interesting thing. When you read the story between Jacob and Esau, you wonder, so how do we ultimately resolve this issue? When there are the two different interests here, the interest of hunting, the warrior within us that needs to win and needs to compete, and the other side, the more gentle, spiritual, transcendent voice within us. So the interesting is the thing, that which seems so odd, more than odd, seems so unethical in a way. You find the story that Jacob actually sells, buys the birthright from Esau. He gives him a, um, a, 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 a broth of, of, of that, that Esau was extremely hungry after he was hunting that day. And he says, I'll give it to you if you, if you allow me to um, buy from you the birthright. And he does that. Then later, when Isaac, their father, wants to bless Esau, the, oh, the firstborn, so Jacob, at his, mother's, uh, at his mother's encouragement and direction, actually dresses in the garments of Esau and fools his father into giving him the blessings, which seems extremely odd for a person that we call wholesome, scholar, transcendent. That seems very much very selfish and very, uh, very unethical, actually. But there's a deep story here that really teaches us a methodology of how to relieve the battle between matter and spirit, and ultimately between good and evil, and create a complete harmony between the two. And here it is with a, a beautiful analogy from the Baal Shem Tov, the great mystic, the founder of the Hasidic movement, 18th century mystic, Rabbi Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. And he says the following. He says... Um, that a king, giving an analogy, who's aging and ailing, and he wanted his son to become his heir to the throne, but he knew that his son had grown up in the palace, spoiled, always catered to, always taken care of. And he was wondering whether his son is really worthy and sensitive enough to be a, uh, a, a power, a, an a, a appropriate leader. So the king decides to do something which was very painful, but he, necessary. He sends his son, he says, I'll send my son away from the palace where he doesn't live in an environment where everyone knows who he is and therefore caters to him and takes care of him. And he has to make it on his own. So he'll become a sensitive human being and sensitive to the subject so when the day comes that he's a leader, he'll be the right and righteous and appropriate leader. So the day finally comes, he tells his son, I want to send you away. It's not easy for me to do, but it's important for, your, for, to, for you to create, to train and season you to be able to be the appropriate and sensitive leader that you should be. Now the king says to him, look, I'm, I'm sure that when, once you leave this place, in the beginning it will be difficult, but slowly you'll get used to your ways, and you may even forget where you come from. So I'm going to send you a letter several times a year to remind you that you're my son, and you've been sent there to be trained, to be groomed, to be that sensitive leader that we're looking for. Okay. The day comes, the sad day comes, he sends his child away, all with the good intentions. And yes, he, he goes to some far distant city in the kingdom. And time passes, and in time he assimilates and gets accustomed to his ways, where he's not being uh, treated in any special treatment, he's not the prince. He's just another guy, a person, a person in the street, and has to make it on his own. But as the king promises him, every little while he receives a letter from his father and tells him, remember who you are. Remember why you're there. When, he, when he, he receives the letter, suddenly he reminds himself, though he had long forgotten, and he wants to celebrate. The problem is, what, he's going to tell, what is he going to tell his neighbors, his, the, the other townspeople? What is he going to say? I'm really, your, 
I will be your future king. I'm really the prince. Either they won't believe him or they'll think he's crazy or they may even hurt him. So he comes up with a brilliant idea. What is the idea? He'll throw a party. A party. Free food and drink. Free cocktails. On me. Now, a party who, 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 uh, does, who rejects a party? Everybody participates and everybody's partying. Beautiful food, great drinks, great company, so social, socializing. Big one, big party. While they're celebrating their free party, he, meanwhile, is celebrating the letter that he received from his father. Says the Baal Shem Tov, this is an analogy. The king is the divine, the higher reality, which we call the essence of it all, God. This, every one of our souls is the prince or princess. But when we live in heaven, in spiritual realms, without any challenges, we can get spoiled. We cannot appreciate our gifts because everything is taken care of. There are no, there's no difficulties. There are no setbacks. There's no pain. There's no suffering. There's no health issues. There's no livelihood. There's money issues. So God says, the king says, I want to send the soul into this material world, a hostile world, a world where the soul has to make it on its own so to speak. I will give it strength, but it has to make it, it can't be just seen that it's like the prince or the princess in the palace. So the soul comes into this world and we're made to forget the spiritual consciousness and higher awareness where we originate from. But several times a year, or maybe once a week, on the Shabbat or other times, holidays, we receive a letter, we receive a spiritual message from on high, telling us, why are you here? You're here to spiritualize this material world. Never forget your mission. And suddenly the soul remembers. There's a problem, however. It's gotten used to the body. It's gotten used to this material world. It's gotten accustomed to it. And we see ourselves as physical beings, maybe on a spiritual journey, but not as spiritual beings on a physical journey. So what does the soul do? So the soul, great idea. We'll throw a party, make a holiday meal, a Shabbat, a Shabbat meal, we have good drinks and good food. You rest more, you're more socializing. So the body goes along because why not? Hey, it's getting everything it needs. It's getting delicious new food, fresh food, intriguing food, delicacies. So while the body is celebrating on its terms, the soul is celebrating the deeper spiritual message of its personal mission in life. In other words, in this material world, if you want to spiritualize the material world, you can either go to battle with it and try to vanquish it or overwhelm it. Or asceticism, as I mentioned before, where you, try, you just avoid it. Or the third option is to engage with it. On its terms, like just like you teach a child, here's a candy if you study well, if you say thank you. The candy, obviously, is just an incentive. The child will grow older will realize that was just a way of teaching the value of being a good person. So we, te we educate the body on its terms and say, fine, it's good. Being a good person is good also materially. It's also good for you. So the animal within us, the animal soul within us, the ace of within us, is thanking. I'm getting good food. I'm getting a, a, a good broth. Jacob dressed up in the garments of ace of means that the soul dresses up in the garments of the material world. And on its terms, it explains that it's good for you as well. That's what a good marketing and salesperson does. That teaches us that it's also good for us. So while the body is celebrating, the material world is celebrating its benefits, the soul can really celebrate its, the real truth behind it all. So there are really two partners, two twins, two, a twin, set of twins, all doing one job. That was really the goal. So when you read the story, the deeper part of the story, you realize it's actually the formula for harmony between matter and spirit, between body and soul, between the inner and the outer, between form and function, to create one fusion. And that's the story of our lives, because we too have these two voices. Every moment of your life, you have two choices. Are you going to do something for yourself, or are you going to do something for others? Is it self-interest-driven? Is it egocentric? Or is it God-centric? Is it driven by what you need right now, or is it driven by the higher purpose of your life? And if you wake up in the morning, you could say, I'll sleep another half hour. No, I'm going to get up to help somebody, to volunteer. You make money. Will I share some of that money in a charitable and kind way? You're talented or you have other gifts. Are you going to use it just for your own needs or also share? This is the battle between the Jacob and Esau within us. We're not asking you to give up the material world. We're not asking you to destroy it. We're not asking you to avoid it. We're saying you can spiritualize it. 
teach matter and the physical world to align itself, that it's also in your interest, transcendence. Transcendence is not just for the soul, it's also for the body, but the body has to be trained. Just like you have to teach a young child from young age, you have to train the child on its terms. So as a young child, you do it for the ulterior motives. Just like when you teach an idea, you have to dress it up in examples and analogies and metaphors. You're not compromising the idea, you're simply putting it into terms that someone can understand. And as they get older, they can strip it from those analogies and come to understand, ah, that's what you meant. And that's the ultimate goal. So at the end of the day, even though these two forces can turn into good and to evil, but it's not purely just that. It's about really integrating and recognizing that that they both are parts of one reality. And ultimately, Jacob and Esau, the end of their story is that they will join together. It takes time. As we refine the material world and we refine our own material physical lives, we turn it into a vehicle for spiritual growth and spiritual transcendence. And that will be the day, what we call the messianic age, when they will join together body and soul, matter and spirit, form and function, in one dance, in one harmony, in one synthesis, where they both are focused on the third dimension, which is neither body nor soul, that transcends even transcendence a reality that is able to integrate the two because it comes from a place that's greater than the two. So my friends, each of us has this choice every given moment in our lives, and Jacob and Esau teach us. They are essentially reflections of these two archetypes within each one of us, meant to be twins, true twins, that end up reconciling, and not just reconciling, but complementing each other in that great harmony. So thank you for listening. This has been Simon Jacobson, Biblical Characters Decoded, Please go to MeaningfulLife.com where you could see this program and many others, a full robust schedule of events and, and subjects that cover every topic from A to Z. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your feedback, your comments, your questions, and please share it as we try to accomplish this particular goal, which is to create a ripple effect where we actually transform this material world and turn it into a spiritual oasis, a spiritual garden. Be well.